This is an overview of an article entitled Polygenic Contribution in Individuals with Early Onset Coronary Artery Disease, published in the January 2018 issue of Circulation, Genomic and Precision Medicine. Let's begin with an actual patient case. A 37-year-old woman has presented with an ST segment elevation myocardial infarction, or STEMI, affecting a single major epicardial vessel. She undergoes percutaneous coronary intervention. In assessing her risk factor profile, essentially all of the traditional risk factors are lacking in her case, with the exception of her being a smoker. Her lipid profile is unremarkable, and she has no family history of early onset coronary artery disease, or EOCAD. By any conventional assessment of risk, whether the Framingham risk score, the pooled cohort equations, or some other algorithm, she's a low-risk patient. Prior to her myocardial infarction, we would have had no reason to consider preventive therapy for her, besides giving her the standard advice to quit smoking. It's unclear what might have caused her to develop coronary artery disease at such a young age. There's no suggestion that she might have familial hypercholesterolemia, which is the most common monogenic, or single gene, driver of early onset coronary artery disease. Nor does she have a family history. Nonetheless, we might suspect that genetics is still playing a role, and in particular, it might be a combination of genes that are responsible, a polygenic cause of her disease. In genome-wide association studies, or GWASs, one examines the DNA of many individuals with the disease, such as cases of coronary artery disease, and many unaffected individuals, controls without disease. There are many common DNA variants, single nucleotide polymorphisms, or SNPs, throughout the human genome. Unlike rare variants, which might be unique to a person and would require exome sequencing or genome sequencing to detect, these common variants are relatively inexpensive to screen. And in fact, it's these common variants that are assessed by popular direct-to-consumer services. Most common SNPs have two alleles, a more common major allele and a less common minor allele. In a GWAS, the question is asked of each SNP in the genome. Is there a difference in the relative frequency of the SNP alleles in the cases versus the controls? If there is a statistically significant difference, it suggests that the SNP is marking a region of the genome, a locus, containing some genetic factor that influences the disease process. For a complex, polygenic disease like coronary artery disease, we'd expect a sizable number of SNPs across the genome to be associated with disease. However, each of these associated SNPs would mark a small change in risk of coronary artery disease. In aggregate, these SNPs might substantially predispose or conversely protect against disease. The authors of the paper under discussion examined a recent GWAS meta-analysis on coronary artery disease from the Cardiogram plus C4D consortium, who studied almost 200,000 people. The authors selected 182 independent, unlinked SNPs that showed evidence of association in the GWAS, and they used these SNPs to generate a genetic risk score, termed the GRS-182 score. They calculated the score by adding up the number of risk-conferring alleles of each SNP, weighted by the effect size on coronary artery disease. The stronger the effect on disease risk in the population, the greater the weight given to the SNP in the score. They then took advantage of openly available data from the UK Biobank project for more than 100,000 participants who had sufficient genetic data to allow the GRS-182 score to be calculated. Of these individuals, 96 were determined to have early onset coronary artery disease, 
through an assessment of their electronic medical records. The other participants were considered to be control individuals. Early onset was defined as less than 40 years of age for men and less than 45 years of age for women. When the authors plotted the GRS-182 scores for the control group, shown here in green or brown, they observed a normal distribution of scores. The distribution of scores was also fairly normal for the 96 EOCAD patients, shown here in pink, but it was right skewed compared to the control group. This indicates that the EOCAD patients, on average, have higher GRS-182 scores suggesting that polygenic risk might be contributing to their disease. The authors were able to use these data to determine that a one standard deviation increase in a GRS-182 score corresponds to an odds ratio of 1.84 for early onset coronary artery disease. The higher the score, the higher the risk. Interestingly, people with high GRS-182 scores had higher proportions of hypertension and first-degree family members with heart disease, suggesting that polygenic risk contributes to those factors. Nonetheless, even after adjustment for these factors, as well as other traditional risk factors, the authors found that the odds ratio for a one-standard deviation increase in the GRS-182 score was largely the same, at 1.78. One very interesting question is how the polygenic risk, signified by a higher GRS-182 score, compares to the monogenic risk, signified by a rare variant or mutation in a gene involved in familial hypercholesterolemia, or FH, in which patients can have extremely high cholesterol levels and, as a consequence, early onset coronary artery disease. It has recently been calculated in a large healthcare system-based study that people with a single copy of an FH gene mutation have an increase in risk of early onset coronary artery disease with an odds ratio of 3.7 compared to the average person. Using that same odds ratio of 3.7 as a benchmark, the authors here used the GRS-182 scores in the UK Biobank population to determine that 1 in 53 people in the population have very high GRS-182 scores that translate into an increased risk of disease with an odds ratio of 3.7. What this means is that about 2% of the population is predicted to have increased polygenic risk for disease, comparable to the increased monogenic risk for disease that's conferred by mutations in FH genes. Of note, a rather smaller number of people in the population have FH gene mutations, about 0.5%. This indicates that polygenic risk might be a bigger driver of early onset coronary artery disease risk in the population than single gene monogenic risk. The authors next turned to a validation cohort of early onset coronary artery disease patients recruited at their institution in Hamilton, Ontario, in Canada. Reasoning that the GRS-182 score calculated in the UK Biobank would be most relevant to people of European descent, they focused on the 30 local Canadian patients who were of European descent, matched ethnicity, and who did not have a secondary cause of coronary artery disease, such as cocaine use. The authors calculated GRS-182 scores for these 30 patients and used the UK Biobank data to determine the predicted odds ratios for early onset coronary artery disease in each individual patient. As shown here, when compared to the UK Biobank control group, the distribution of GRS-182 scores in the Canadian early onset coronary artery disease patients was right skewed towards higher scores. Among these patients, 
the ones with the highest GRS-182 scores were predicted to have remarkably increased risk of disease. Here's a zoomed in version of the figure from the previous slide. If one focuses on the two patients with the highest GRS-182 scores, one sees that they have several fold higher predicted risk of early onset coronary artery disease as estimated from the UK Biobank data. Importantly, none of the 30 patients represented here were found to have FH gene mutations. So, as far as we know, the genetic contribution to their disease was driven entirely by polygenic risk from common variants. It so happens that the patient discussed at the beginning of this presentation is Canadian patient number two shown on the previous slide. Recall that she's a 37-year-old woman with STEMI whose only traditional risk factor was smoking. Now we know that based on her GRS-182 score, which is greater than the 99th percentile in the population, she had an estimated five-fold increase in risk for early onset coronary artery disease compared to the average person. To put this number in context, this is higher than the risk conferred by having an FH gene mutation. Furthermore, this is similar to the increase in risk of breast cancer suffered by people who have mutations in genes like BRCA1 and BRCA2, genes that are commonly tested. What could have been done differently for this patient? Perhaps nothing. But a better question is what could be done differently for patients like this in the future? It's worth noting that genetic risk scores can be calculated at any time in a person's life, as early as birth, since people's genetic data don't change during the lifetime. So if this patient could have been tested early and was known to have a very high genetic risk score that increased her risk fivefold, she could have been counseled and treated early and aggressively. Certainly, the critical importance of tobacco cessation for her could have been emphasized, and early initiation of aspirin and statin therapy could have been entertained. In conclusion, this study found that a genetic risk score comprising 182 common variants can identify about 2% of the population with greatly increased risk of early onset coronary artery disease on par with the risk in people with rare familial hypercholesterolemia gene mutations. In the future, this could allow for the early identification of people who warrant aggressive preventive therapy. Finally, it's possible that screening of patients for high genetic risk scores might actually be of higher yield than screening for FH gene mutations, which has important implications for personalized clinical care. Thank you.